This episode is sponsored by Voltoro. Keep on listening and you will find out more about how you can buy allocated gold when the Bitcoin bull run reaches its peak. This way, you don't have to deal with infinitely inflationary fiat or banks that freeze your account. Also, note that trading involves risks and the information presented is not financial advice. This episode is also sponsored by Wasabi Wallet. Go to wasabiwallet.io, download Wasabi for your OS and significantly boost your network level and transaction privacy. Hello there and welcome to Season 9, Episode 9 of the Bitcoin Takeover Podcast. I am Vlad and my guest today is Max Hildbrand, who is the host of the Join the Wasabi Cuz podcast, which you can hear on the Bitcoin Takeover radio stream. And he's also involved with lots of Bitcoin projects. You may know him for the involvement that he has had with Wasabi Wallet and also his advocacy for the Austrian School of Economics. And today we're going to talk about human action, but from the point of view of praxeology, which is a word so complicated that when you type it, you get that spell check correct and it doesn't recognize it. So it's very deep into philosophy to talk about human action through praxeology, which is the science of studying human action, unless you're going to correct me, Max. And that's kind of the topic today. And also we have a very similar view on El Salvador and how Bitcoin adoption should happen. So I guess you're going to hear a lot of like mindedness on that front. (laughs) So hi, Max. Well, thank you very much, Vlad, for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. And yes, praxeology is the logic of human action and uh, the, the logos, you know, the, the thinking based on first principles about a problem right? and using deductive reasoning and verbal logic uh, to analyze a case. It's right? specifically one of, well, human action. Uh, that's the main focus of the study. And economics is one subsection out of this. Right? Uh, and, you know, that's one of the things that I loved looking at long before Bitcoin was trying to figure out how to be a more efficient entrepreneur and how to understand how the economy works. And after realizing that Keynesian economics and modern monetary theory is all bullshit, uh, then you are kind of left with the Austrian school of economics, which is this last bastion of hope and for freedom and, and reason in, well, thinking and discovering truth about consequences that are inevitable uh, as economic laws are. You know, Max, I would argue that you are not left with Austrian economics, you are right with Austrian economics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's that's the other thing, this left-right paradigm. If It does not really make sense if you look at it from a, you know, a praxeological point of view. Um, Rothbard kind of lays out a completely different dividing area, you know, of the people who steal and the people who get stolen from, you know, the taxpayers and the tax receivers. Um, and I think that's a much, much more reasonable divide. And so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm left or right. Uh, I'm on the side of freedom and property rights. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And that's why we are here, I guess. We like private property. We like freedom. We like to study the sciences, which sort of justify our purposes it's kind of backwards as chris de rose said in the first episode like you need to justify the way that you are which is kind of crazy but we are humans and we ended up doing this so what is it about praxeology that fascinates you so much you have talked about it a lot especially since the case of el salvador came out and you started arguing from the point of view of praxeology yeah, I think the reason why I love praxeology shows perfectly in that El Salvador case. Uh, because so praxeology is an a priori science, right? Meaning that that we can logically reduce or deduce from certain basic principles, uh, you know, outcomes. And as long as our basic axiomatic principles hold up and our logical reasoning is is verifiably correct, right, then we we can say that the conclusions you know the outcome is true it's valid 
right? And and it will occur. Uh, that's that's somewhat of the beauty, and it makes you see through bullshit quite a lot, right? So, for example, the case of El Salvador, where people like merchants are now forced to use the Bitcoin technology at least as a medium uh, of exchange to give away their currencies in exchange for this good. And then, of course, later having the option to give away the, these Bitcoin for a different monetary asset that they would like to receive. But at least that aspect of accepting Bitcoin is mandated by the state, right? Now, us as Bitcoin enthusiasts, we you know should be ent ent enthralled by this, right? We will, we're going to have so many more merchants uh, taking Bitcoin payments. Like, that's awesome, right? Uh, but, you know, that's the beauty of Braxiology. It kind of keeps you... or. It, you, you, you stay with a cool head to realize then that, well, wait a second, you know, if we, if we take stuff from other people, if we, for, if we forcefully, you know, violate them to act in a certain way that they don't choose to act freely, voluntarily by themselves, then all of a sudden we no longer have mutual beneficial engagement and uh, we no longer see a prosperity for every party involved, right? Clearly, that one person uh, who gets being violated uh, is worse off, right? And that does not have to be the case. That's only the case in politics where you force people to do something. But in, in the case of a voluntary free market society, every trade is voluntary and therefore mutual beneficial. Uh, so, you know, therefore, just by first principles, forcing people to accept Bitcoin is a bad idea. And it will lead in more close praxeological analysis to quite drastic outcomes that are contrary to our cause, which is to advance Bitcoin, you know, as uh, to become that, uh, that broadly used medium of exchange uh, and store of value, right? That's, that's ultimately the goal. But forcing people to use Bitcoin is not the actual way to getting there. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. And I have defined it in terms of forcing people to be free. And this has been a philosophical concept which has been debated a lot in the 18th century. And it was debated from the point of view of the doctor, for example. Because you as a patient, when you go to the doctor, you have no idea why you're sick. But the doctor knows better and the doctor can act against your will to do something to you which is going to be beneficial for you on the long term. But I don't think that this situation with El Salvador or anything concerning economics is like this, a matter of life and death, something that can be justified with authoritarian intervention. With the adoption of a new form of currency, I'm always on the side of doing it, of starting from education and doing something which is grassroots and is there to stay. Whereas when you start something from above and this new leader says, we're going to use this new currency, it only means that it's going to last for as long as the leadership lasts. And if you look at what happened in El Salvador during the last century, basically, you're going to see that they had so many regime changes and the average length of a presidency is of about four years. And the previous leader was a guerrilla kind of guy who used to be a member of some paramilitary group. And this new guy is from a party whose name is Nuevas Ideas or something like that, which stands for new ideas. And it makes sense for someone who comes with this platform of new ideas to come up with something revolutionary in terms of money. But you should also regard this from the lens of the greater scheme and what has happened in El Salvador in the last century. And you're going to figure out that people actually like change. And it's likely that they're going to like it when they change whatever happened with Bitcoin and revert to some fiat or something like that, just because some of them think that it hasn't worked or they think that they should try something new. Yeah, exactly. That's true. So uh, I think I actually wrote an article about this. You're going to get a magazine sometime from me and it's about when is a country ready to adopt Bitcoin? And my main argument is that if you really want to go against the global financial system as a country and you want to do it as a government, as opposed to allowing your citizens to adopt Bitcoin, because personally, I think that the best way for a government to adopt Bitcoin is to do nothing about it and allow the citizens to adopt it. 
and the people in power should ignore it until there is a critical mass of people who are ready to use it in a sovereign way with nodes and everything else. And only after that you can make decisions which are so radical as to create a framework for legal tender. You can't just enforce it and say, we're going to do this, but most of the people are uneducated because they're not going to use Bitcoin. That's part of my argument. And this is going to be my talk, my presentation in Mallorca at the conference. They're not going to use the Bitcoin network. Most likely they're going to use a custodian who uses an Excel or MySQL database to settle transactions. So that's kind of the worst use case because it has no censorship resistance. It has no unconfiscatability. Are you okay? Oh yes, I thought this was muted. Uh, I thought you fell or something. No, just move the mic. <laughs> okay. So as I was saying, if you don't adopt in a place where the people are educated enough as to how the Bitcoin network works and how they should use the software, they will turn to convenience and they're going to use something which most likely doesn't charge them fees. So they're going to go to a custodian because usually that's the case. If it's settled in a database, you're not going to have fees because it doesn't use the Bitcoin network. So they're going to look for that. They're going to look for the nicest interface and possibly only not necessarily only companies, but there are some companies which are very good at designing nice interfaces. You look at blockchain.com, the wallet. That's one of the most popular ones that are downloaded on mobile, but it's also one of the worst in terms of features and what it does. And that's actually an SPV one, but something like Strike is custodial. So I'm very skeptical. And the government from El Salvador also said that they're going to have their own wallet. So I suppose that a lot of people are going to turn to that one just because they don't feel comfortable choosing something else. If they're not educated and they don't really see the point, they're going to follow the leadership. And if they follow the leadership, that defeats the whole purpose of adopting Bitcoin. And some people are very optimistic about it and they go forward with the argument that you need to start from somewhere and get educated. But I don't see much freedom taking place in that country. And I don't think that there's going to be a lot of encouragement for people to become free. Actually, I think Bitcoin goes against the idea of government and control. If anything, you're going to have a minimal government with Bitcoin. And, you know, as, as you bring up, it's so difficult to answer the question of when your government should go into Bitcoin. And the reason why that is, is basically laid out in praxeological reasoning. And, that, and this is what Mises explains in his phenomenal book on socialism, uh, where he lays out that without having a individualistic property right uh, protection and uh, is allowing a free market to flourish. There are no prices in free exchange. And without prices, we have no way to allocate our resources effectively. Right? Uh, to, uh, and because of that, well, you will get malinvestment and overconsumption. Uh, that's the gist of it, which we should probably get into much more in depth on how to reason about this. But the underlying conclusion of this program is uh, that people will get into Bitcoin, quote unquote, too early, right? Where the technology is not yet ready, uh, where the primary use are bad wallets like blockchain.com or even worse, some uh, Coinbase or, you know, some other uh, very uh, not optimal uh, technology. Uh, while, you know, as free individuals freely choose when they want to use a cutting edge technology, they might be more cautious and wait another three, four, five years right, before, uh, until then, the you know software is further developed, more secure, better tested. In other words, there are a thousand and one reasons why not to use Bitcoin, right? And we should respect the free choice of people to do exactly that, right? To not use Bitcoin if they don't want to. Yeah, not only that, but 
it's going to be difficult to price products and services while we are still in this volatile price discovery phase. I find it puzzling and sometimes, you know, should a merchant have to change the price like three, four times a day if something massive happens just to keep up or take losses potentially just because they were forced to accept Bitcoin or change their prices every day if maybe that they have a fixed price in their local fiat, which happens to be the US dollar. And I think that's another big problem because they're not going against the central bank of El Salvador. They are going against Uncle Sam when they decide that Bitcoin should accompany the US dollar as legal tender. Yeah, and you know, denominating your contracts and your prices in Bitcoin is absolutely doable. And I personally love doing it, right? Uh, and I go about it in a way that uh, I, I don't even change my prices much. For the last half year or so, my prices have been the same, denominated in Bitcoin. Right? The, disregarding the short-term volatility uh, of the US dollar value right, denominated in Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, eventually people get there. But uh, just because I have some, you know, crazy idea to use Bitcoin as my unit of account, that doesn't mean that I should force other people to make the same reckless decision. Uh, because what I'm doing here is, is crazy first uh, and has multiple risks, right, that I'm only willing to take because I am a, a freak enthusiast for this awesome monetary technology. Uh, but expecting other people to have the same value preferences as I do, is ludicrous yeah not only that but it's also about time preference because if you take a loss for example in usd terms i suppose you can afford to take the loss for four or five years and wait until you break even but there are people out there who need to pay their rent need to buy supplies to keep their shops going and have expenses and they can't afford maybe Actually, I don't think that many locals are going to be using Bitcoin between themselves. I'm very skeptical about that. I think Bitcoin is more like a tourist ticket or invitation for outsiders, for foreigners to come in and spend their money. At least that's how I perceive the fact that they added Bitcoin as a legal tender. They see themselves as a country for tourists that's going to welcome Westerners who are willing to spend money there and help them develop. And their president even tried to imply that they can sell their real estate, their buildings, their beach houses for BTC so that you can actually move there if you want. But I would not move there <laughs> for reasons which don't concern just their, their lockdown policy, which is a lot worse than the countries in which we live and we like to criticize on a daily basis, but also the fact that there's so much uncertainty. Like, I don't want to live in a place where you don't know if this president is going to disappear tomorrow and get replaced or this president is going to replace the whole parliamentary assembly with a military dictatorship. There are so many uncertainties, but I guess that's priced in as a risk factor when you purchase the real estate as at a lower rate than the rest of the world. I guess a, a beach house there is affordable, but you take the risks of possibly not having any kind of private property in the future. Yeah, that's true. You know, every country is pretty bad, but some countries are worse than other. So, uh, you know, but again, the beauty is, you know, free choice and people have their own individual risk trade-offs and value judgments. Uh, so, you know, do what you do. Exactly. But by the way, what's your take on democracy? As I see a lot of critics of democracy, and I suspect that Saifedean is responsible for spreading this skepticism on whether or not a democracy is legitimate and can work or scale or exist for a number of years. And Saifedean presented this case of the monarchy as being superior. Whereas I think the fact that we got rid of monarchies, at least in Europe, was one of the best choices. Yeah, so it, there are multiple levels of analysis. Um, let's first 
start with something other than praxeology. Let's first go into the realm of ethics. Uh, and here there is a philosophy of, of natural law uh, that basically, you know, to dumb it down very much, uh, says that uh, uh, do not steal the private property of, of another individual, right? To, to violate the non-aggression principle, to initiate harm against the, the property of a peaceful individual right? that includes his body as well as the scarce goods that he homesteaded. Right, that so this would include include crimes like murder or assault or uh, theft or rape or trespassing right, or or lying in contracts. Uh, these are all um, yeah th these are all taking away of someone else's property in a scarce resource. And according to this ethical rule, that's unjustifiable. Right, that's just not right. And it does not matter if one person takes the property from the other person. Or if it is a group of 10 people who hold a vote and seven out of 10 people agree all right, that, that they should take the property of the other person and then all 10 people come over and uh, you know steal his property, uh, that doesn't make the theft any worse just because a group of people did it. Even if they held a ceremony where they voted or you know whatever other uh, ceremony that they could come up with. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you meant it doesn't make it any less worse or any better. Exactly. Yeah. So you, so you that, said it doesn't make it any worse, which it, <laughs> it, it, it it's it's not a justification, right? Uh, there are numerous justifications that people come up with to violate the property of other individuals. Democracy is one of the many ones, but yeah, I think a tyranny of the majority is is horrible uh, <laughs> because then if you're the minority. You end up you end up getting raped, uh, literally, and that's not a nice thing. So let's probably not do that. Um, now the question is: Is monarchy any better, right, on the ethical realm? What if you have you know one king uh, who has the monopoly of violence and who has the justification, you know, to steal your property, to tax you, uh, or to you know license your business or whatever other tyranny and infringement of property that is proposed, and. Right? Again, ultimately, it's just one dude taking your stuff uh, that's not nice and it breaks basic ethics and morals, right? Um, so it's, yeah, that's, again, no difference. But where praxeology and economics provides an interesting argument um, is in the long-term consequences to the capital structures of the different types of governing over a body of slaves, Basically, right. So both the monarch as well as the democrat, uh, uh, the democratic bureaucrat, uh, has the ownership over his tax slaves. Now the question is, which of the two models is superior in allocating these resources across the uncertainty of the future? Um, and here a basic argument, uh, and that was laid out beautifully by Hans Hermann Hoppe in the book uh, "Democracy: The God That Failed." in, I believe, somewhere in, of the 1980s, um, where he lays out that because the monarch is a ruler for life, basically, he has a longer ownership title into his subjects, right, compared to a bureaucrat in a democracy that gets uh, elected only for four years, for example, right, for some shorter period of time. Uh, and this is a, a, a display a, a proof, so to say, an observable fact that a monarch has a lower time preference than a, a democratically elected bureaucrat. Right? Just because the monarch is thinking not just until his own death, right, but because of the inheritance even into the death of his children. Right? So this is a multi-generational thinker compared to a bureaucrat who only has a four-year ruling cycle of ownership. Uh, so the difference in incentive here is that the monarch will make uh, choices involving deeper production stages right, and with a long-term consequences of a failure uh, to these deep production stages. While a bureaucrat, of course, when engaging in long production stages, um, they do not reap the consequences of that. Right By the time that this venture succeeds or fails, uh, they are already out of the office. So they have literally no skin in the game. Right? And that leads to a tendency to malinvest and overconsume the resources at the disposal of the slave masters. 
um, in this case, the bureaucrats. Uh, and therefore, uh, in even if you are a slave, living under a low time preference ruler is superior than living under a high time preference ruler. And we see that monarchies have a lower time preference than uh, democracies have, right? Uh, and therefore, we can deduce that monarchies are preferable. While obviously, and just to hammer this home, both are systems of slavery and both are both morally abhorrent as well as economically wasteful. So I will take it that your argument concerns time preference and the way that those in power or in government think when they have the power. But this only makes sense in the ideal case when the monarch actually rules for life. But in history, we have seen so many coup d'etat attempts and assassinations and all sorts of conflicts between noble families. And in the history of Europe, we have so many cases where it was not, in fact, the case that the monarch ruled for life on one hand and considered the decisions regarding his ruling to be something on the long term. Uh, this is on the other hand, because they were very much aware about all the conflicts that were taking place. And most of the times they would irrationally allocate resources for the simple concern of trying to keep themselves into power. And that's one of Absolutely, the vices right. of monarchy. And one of your definitions of democracy earlier was that it's a tyranny of the majority, which is only the definition of the democracy from our ancient times when Plato defined it. But since 1787, when we have had the American Revolution and the American Constitution, we have defined democracy more as a republic in the republican sense, which means that you get a constitution, which is the central part of your state establishment, and you're allowed to vote on issues which concern extensions of this constitution, but not the constitution itself. So if you have a right to life in the constitution or something which guarantees your physical integrity or the integrity of your private property, you cannot actually cast a vote and propose that you should vote in favor of killing somebody or in favor of appropriating somebody's private property or stuff like that. If the constitution is well written, at its worst, you can have perverse people who interpret it in different ways, which favor short-term decisions, which has been the case. But I think it's still a lot better than all the turmoil and all the conflicts that you get when you get kings, because their position is going to be challenged all the time. I don't think anyone is happy to be ruled by a king unless they... I don't know, they don't have many expectations from life. Oh, but you see, the beautiful thing is, as you highlight, that when you're a king and you make stupid decisions and you squander the resources of your kingdom, right, then the people will not be happy. And what will they do? They will cut off your head. Right? That's literally skin in the game. Right? That's a good thing, not a bad thing, because it's a consequence for mistakes to the person who makes the decisions. Right? That is great. That's why I love the free market. Right? Because in a free market, if you're an individual or a company and you allocate your resources and you invest them across time, well, if you don't earn a revenue, then you're going to have losses and nobody's going to pay you back. Right? You're ultimately responsible for your own mistakes. Right? It's not that entrepreneurs in a free market are perfect and infallible creatures that magically solve all problems without any hiccup. Right. It's it's rather on the other side that if free market entrepreneurs make a mistake, right, then they are falling down the hierarchy and uh, lose their capital and they have losses instead of profits. Right. So to have skin in the game is a great thing. And monarchs have more skin in the game because, well, you can easily cut off their heads. Compare that now to a democracy. Let's take, for example, the current fuck up with, with the lockdowns and the economic stranglehold uh, during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, whose heads are going to roll for this, right? For the millions of lives destroyed and businesses shut down right? and, and the economy in, in ruins. Um, 
whose whose heads are gonna roll? Which which one monarch uh, can we pick? Well, none really, because the mistakes were made. You know, twenty election cycles in the past. Uh, so the consequences now uh, are are not as closely caused by the people who are currently in power. And so it's it's a very different thing uh, compared to a monarchy where you know if the monarch is debasing his money, you kill him and reinstitute a new money. Voltoro, and that's V-A-U-L-T, like a gold volt, and O-R-O, Oro, which is Spanish for gold, is a gold and Bitcoin exchange, which offers instant swaps between hard money to over 31,000 customers from more than 95 countries. Voltoro has offered Swiss privacy and security since 2015. Furthermore, the gold you purchase is your legal property, secured in your name, so even if something happens to Voltoro, even liquidators could not touch your gold. If you want to become the custodian of your own gold bars, you can request to have them delivered to you or simply trade them back to Bitcoin on the dip. Register for free in only 30 seconds and start trading only with hard money. Please keep in mind that all trading involves risks. This is not financial advice and you are responsible for your own decisions. When you are using Wasabi Wallet, your internet connection gets routed through the Tor network by default. This means that you get better privacy while using Bitcoin. Download it today at wasabiwallet.io. I agree that the consequences of bad decisions are most likely felt by future generations, and that's a major flaw in the design. But the reason why I like democracy as opposed to something else is that I think the feature of democracy is that you can vote out anyone, and you also have limited terms for some situations. So you get the chance to scrutinize somebody after each cycle, and you determine whether or not you want to see them again in office. And of course, there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of authoritarianism. And there are lots of ways to bribe voters and situations like that. But if it really gets nasty, I'm pretty sure that the, the I don't know, the most influential of tyrants and the most charismatic of them is going to get voted out. And something is going to happen f- as the system is constructed to have checks and balances And there's always one side which is going to use its power to counter something which is happening. And all this conflictual situation only guarantees the freedom of the people, at least in theory. When you get the lockdowns, I guess there was a little too much agreement between the parties and not enough disagreement. And if there was any disagreement, it was silenced. And I think which is how it usually goes. This kind of issue right now goes beyond the fabric of our political systems. I think it extends towards lobby groups and social networks, which which have become political entities in themselves because they influence elections. They can change opinions. They can choose who is the good guy and who is the bad guy on a daily basis because we spend so much time there and we see news beyond our action and grasp so we can follow certain topics we can like certain people and follow them but at the end of the day we get displayed news we get displayed ads and also search engines prioritize some news over others and i don't know it feels like it doesn't really matter as much what we vote it matters what we choose to consume in our daily lives because we are empowering corporations to have more control with the choices that we make in terms of technology. Yeah, that that all sounds true in a sense. Um, Is this like a pause or did you cut out? No, just a pause in thinking. <laughs> okay. I think the world has become a lot more complex and... Under any kind of political regime, regardless whether it was a monarchy or a democracy or a clocracy or anything else from the books of political regimes, 
we would end up in the same situation if we had social media giants and big tech. And my argument is not that it should get regulated, but that we should get more competition on one hand, and we should encourage people to use the competition as opposed to converging towards Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple and who else? Microsoft. Yeah, but you see, I think, you know, currently, as you say, all previous types of government, forms of government have failed to a greater or lesser extent. Right. Um, so m sure, maybe we find a newer, better way to do governance, right, and politics. Uh, but I'm not so sure, right? I mean, how about we just use an approach that seemed to be working quite well, right? Freedom instead of slavery, uh, and let's establish private properties uh, and recognize uh, individual sovereignty, uh, which will, in my opinion, uh, lead to you know a greater prosperity for all. Um, so. In, instead of thinking how to use force to make a better society, let's just realize that applying aggression is in general, in any shape or form, with any justification, a net negative for everyone. Um, so doing this uh, doesn't make sense. Uh, let's move on to a more civilized society without politics, uh, but with freedom. That's going to be difficult as maybe that the two of us can agree that we can leave each other alone and live happy and peaceful lives. But there are types of people who always expect to, to get stuff for free without putting any kind of work into it. And they're going to look for forceful ways into coercing others to give them what they want. And but that's see the situation where conflicts get created. And in the end, you you're going to have to do politics. But you see, there there uh, is a difference between pacifism and anarchism. Right? Pacifism is basically that you shall never apply force against another individual. Uh, and that's maybe you know, a good strategy, but I guess you're going to get killed pretty quickly. Right? Um, on, on the other hand, uh, anarchism is that do not aggress, do not un initiate any violence against another individual. But that axiom of non-aggression comes fundamentally hand in hand on the other side of the coin with the axiom of self-defense. That if another individual initiates aggressive force against your body or property, that then you have a natural right and a logical claim right, to apply force in, the, in, in your defense and against that attacker. Right? It, even to the extent of death, if that is what needs to, to be taken in order to stop the attack. And so anarchism uh, based on praxeological reasoning uh, is for sure not uh, like a, uh, a pacifist thinking. Oh, I did not imply that it's pacifist, but I just extended the conversation towards human nature and the way that our evolution and society has taught us to become. And you have freeloaders in every type of possible society and regime. And they get treated in a different way. If you go to Sweden as a freeloader, you're going to get free housing, free quote unquote, which means it's going to get paid by the taxpayers who actually work for you to get that. You're going to get housing and education to learn the language and you're going to get food every day. And they're going to do their best to try to integrate you into the society and become a productive member. But if you go like this in the United States, I suppose you're going to have to actually work to survive or else you're going to sleep on the streets. So it treats this differently. But I don't think that's the case anymore in the United States as it's becoming more socialist. And I think this socialism comes with a corporate type of flavor so it's not really socialism it's just a way for corporations to become more established as every piece of regulation or every universal basic income decision and every paycheck that's being given to people with burr money it favors a very small elite of companies which already have an established status and the fact that this happens only means that competition is going to become 
a lot harder to produce or to bring in front. If you think about it nowadays, if you want to compete with something like Twitter, it's going to be very difficult. And even the Bitcoin community, which I think is pure in its intentions and constantly has some of the highest standards for software, somehow accepts this tyranny of big tech for the purpose of interacting with normies and celebrities and others who use the platform. But we, we have had, I think, three attempts by now to move to Mastodon, which is the decentralized social networking experience. And we haven't. We haven't really. Like We created accounts. We started posting there. But we haven't been consistent because it was a bubble. And not even all of us followed. So I think there is a lot of consent in the sense of convenience sometimes. So even if we agree that we search for the most free solution and the one which makes us most sovereign, we still accept more or less conveniently or more or less pleasantly the involvement of a big tyrant who's going to dictate upon us some rules. And I suppose it's only acceptable as long as we can choose and we can opt out anytime and say, yeah, I'm going to stay for as long as you comply with my ex- expectations. But the moment when you step out of line, I'm going to leave and use an alternative. Yeah, exactly. That aspect of choice and opportunity cost is essential. Right? And by the way, the, the definition of a monopoly based on in, in the Austrian tradition is that when you have a government providing like privileges to one company so that new market participants are prevented from entering the economy right? and, and providing a good or service that is similar to what the established monopolist uh, provides. And so to prevent people from entering the market as an entrepreneur to solve a solution of a customer, and that is a monopoly. And, and as you say, right, with that, that has to be considered. So as, as long as we have options like Mastodon, right, then we cannot say that there's a monopoly on Twitter. Um, uh, you know, even though, of course, Twitter has a massive number of users with great activity and, uh, uh, and you know, a, a massive network effect. And the network effect is part of the value proposition of a communication network. And so um, there are numerous reasons why individuals like Twitter, right? Nice UI, nice UX. Everyone is there, you know, established network effect. It's easy to use and whatnot. I had countless reasons. All of these reasons, by the way, are in the realm of psychology, right? What do people like, right? Uh, And why do they like the stuff that they like, right? Um, uh, Rather, while contrarily, right, when we look at it from a point of view from praxeology, uh, I don't care about why the people like Twitter, right? I'm simply observing after the fact that many people use Twitter, right? And what that means is that these people are have at that point of action, right, where they open the Twitter app, the app, they have demonstrated, you know, provably that currently they value checking Twitter and writing a tweet higher than being on Instagram, you know, or Mastodon or whatever. Right. So praxeology is a observable uh, sci- uh, like science where you look at the action of people and because you see how they acted, as long as they are have acted voluntarily, right, then this is a proof for them being um, you know in favor and agreeing uh, to this to this act. And therefore they thought that the grass on the other side was greener. Right, that they, after the act, were better off than before. Yeah, I agree with you. And let's get, let's get back for a moment to El Salvador, as I think we haven't quite finished with the topic. And I wanted to ask you, what was your first reaction when you read the news about it or when you were watching the live stream? I'm not sure if you were. Um, I was, I was, I found it curious because it was unexpected for sure. Um, and at first I was uh, confused by the wording of it, right? Because it was announced as a legal tender uh, regulation, right? And that would mean, uh, in the classical definition, uh, that Bitcoin has to be 
considered accepted when it is used as a repayment for debt. Right? So you enter a debt contract with a person right, or a company, and when you then later offer a legal tender, like for example physical cash, right, then you uh, the bank needs to consider this debt as settled. Right? And I thought, okay, great, they did the same for Bitcoin. That's that's stupid but understandable. Right? I don't like legal tender laws because I see no reason why to force a banker to accept anything unless he chooses that to be valid and uh, unless it, it, it's specified in the property contract. But okay, that's that's interesting. That's that changes the game theory a bit, right? But then later I realized that it was even a a worse monetary interventionism. So that it's not just considering a mandatory acceptance for the repayment of debt, but, and that's a new thing, uh, to be mandatorily accepted by merchants selling everyday goods and services on spot. Right. So when you walk into a store and you buy your cafe and uh, then you pay for this, right? this is a spot transaction. This is not a debt transaction. Right? You're not settling or you're not creating a debt by picking up the, the chewing gum. And you're not settling the debt by paying it, right? Rather, the the property titles of the chewing gum, you know, goes over when you're actually standing at the cashier and paying. Like this, the property right and the payment are in this scenario atomically linked, right? And are therefore not debt contracts, right? It's it's an instant spot settlement of de- uh, of a payment, right? So classical legal tender laws uh, are much less restrictive than this one. So, for example, in most uh, states of the United State, uh, States, they do not have such a mandate, right? So, for example, even though cash is a legal tender, right, there are many companies, restaurants and such, that go with credit card only, right? So, these people refuse to do business with you if you want to pay them in physical cash bills, right? Even though cash bills are legal tender. This this company accepting only credit cards is not you know evil like that's basically every online shop right um, and this is completely legal right legal tenders does not regulate spot transaction however uh, some countries do have for example a mandated currency regime for let's say cash right so that physical businesses must accept cash they cannot go credit card only right but that's a very different thing to a legal tender and to call such a thing legal tender is very much confusing and misleading right so what el salvador here did is more of a forced currency for everyday uh, payments so to say uh, and again that is monetary interventionism to the finest right if the merchant does not want to use bitcoin technology then who are you to put a gun to his head and tell him, but you must? Uh, you know, that does not make sense. Um, like we should be civilized and engage with each other peacefully, especially because then we know that the other person values what we give him. Right? If you put a gun to someone else's head and tell him that he needs to accept your Bitcoin, well, if he takes them, that's not really a, a pleasant thing. right? It doesn't prove that he really wants to have the Bitcoin. It just proves that he doesn't want to get shot. Right? And the only way to get off your back is uh, is to accept the Bitcoin that you offer, right? And to give up your goods and services in exchange. Um, of course, this is a weird scenario for us who who love Bitcoin, right? And who who think that every merchant obviously should accept Bitcoin. I don't, uh, like I've been yelling from the mountaintops that merchants do that for many years now, right? But still, I, I try to convince them peacefully instead of putting a gun to their head, just because that will not work. They will not like the result. I agree with you. And I recall reading conversations that you had on Twitter, where you were trying to explain to people that most likely they don't understand the implications of what a legal tender means. And I'm happy that you explained that it's a transaction which settles debt. And in the case of Bitcoin, there is no prior debt. So it makes you wonder what the purpose of this actually is and why they chose this exact phrasing of legal tender as opposed to official currency. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's weird. It's somewhat of, uh, it's very confusing, uh, so to say. And again, the, the consequences of such intervention are quite drastic. And, you know, 
but one thing, one interesting thing that in the past, you know, these types of forcing people to actually use a currency in everyday trade, right, was only done for hyper inflating shit coins, right, where just the regime went completely crazy and were printing nuts, right, and then, for example, switching to a new currency or something. Then you had people with guns telling you to use this currency to pay for your bubble gum, but that that those are extreme circumstances with a hyperinflating shitcoin. The interesting nuance here, and that's like what makes this case so 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 interesting, is that all of a sudden we're talking about the hardest, uh, you know, uh, monetary inflation resistant uh, monetary assets that we've ever seen with Bitcoin. Right? It's it's fucking beautiful. Right, so there is a positive incentive for using Bitcoin and for being early in Bitcoin. Right, so actually forcing people to use Bitcoin technology early um, might be uh, the reasoning, right, that this ends up being beneficial in the long run uh, for the people uh, living in that country. Um, that might be true. Maybe they will be very. That will be a very profitable trade for them. But the question is still, right, the seen and the unseen, what are the short term opportunity costs uh, that these people have, right, when they're now forced to spend their time with uh, getting educated about Bitcoin? Well, maybe they could have used that time more to, you know, expand their business to build a second house or whatnot, right? There are other things that these guys could be doing other than needing to worry about Bitcoin. But since the law is introduced, well, they have to. Yeah, and it's on such a short notice. You have to think about the average person because there's always this argument that there's the Bitcoin beach, but that's only one place, a small geographical region of a larger country. And of course, you had commerce there happening for a year or something. But you have to think about the people who possibly heard about Bitcoin the first for the first time when the law got passed. And are they really getting liberated? Because at most, if they're not using the proper kind of wallet and they're not validating their own transaction, the most they can get out of it is to profit from the number go up side of it to maximize their purchasing power if they have the inspiration to huddle, which also only comes with education. I suppose even... Me, I, I'm not sure about you, but when I first got my hands on Bitcoins, my first instinct was, what can I buy with it? And I just bought shit, basically, just because I could, just to prove to myself that this has real monetary value. And I'm not sure if it's going to be very educational or if it's going to have enough time to catch on. But at the same time, I very much appreciate the efforts of those who try to educate people in there. And for example, there's the guy from Seed Signer who is trying to help them build their own hardware wallets. And there's also Fullmo, which has sent, I think, a dozen of full nodes to them. I don't think that's enough, but it's still a lot better than nothing. And I think this is the right way to show them that they have options as opposed to listening to their president when he speaks and He's going to say, yeah, you can choose whichever wallet you want for that helicopter money that we're going to send you. But we also have a governmental wallet just in case you're interested. And I'm very much sure that most people are going to use the government wallet out of convenience because they trust that the government is going to be fair with them. And they would rather trust their government as opposed to some random developer on the Internet because they don't really understand how open source software works and there is a lot of tyrannical there are lots of tyrannical use cases that a government can use against the citizens if they get access to all the transactions and they can see everything basically they can bypass everything that banks were processing and in the case of El Salvador the fact that they're using the US dollar only means that the banks are most likely not really under the control of the local government and are under the influence of the United States of America. So now if they design their own wallet and they can see all the transactions of their people, it only means that they're going to have more control. And if the users are not running their own full nodes, 
they're kind of screwed if they use the government infrastructure because Bitcoin for all of its virtues can turn into a very Orwellian instrument if it's being used in a custodial and not private way or you give away also your public key which means if somebody has your XPUB, they can see all the addresses that you generate, all the transactions that you send and receive, and you're screwed. You have no privacy. They can see all the coins that you own, when you send them, to whom you send them. And I think they're trying to build something similar here in Europe. I'm not sure if you watch the news about I think it came from the European Parliament that they're trying to pass a law to make everyone declare their addresses and eliminate the anonymity of Bitcoin. But it's going to be a lot harder here since, for example, there's Germany, a very good example of a country where users are truly sovereign and you have the highest node count of any country in terms of density of how many nodes per number of users. And I think that's admirable. And if anything, Germany is very ready if it was ever interested in adopting Bitcoin as an official currency. I'm not sure if legal tender is the proper term- terminology in this case. But at the yeah, same I would time... Guess we're pretty far away from that just because of the fact that Germany is a major beneficiary of the European Union money printing. Uh, so that's always a, a bad position to give up at. When yeah, you're I, I at guess the you are the, the, first, money spigot. the first party involved in the Cantillon effect, right? <laughs> exactly. So I guess to some extent, it's useful to start this experiment in a country which is open to experiments, but you should not have high expectations. And if this goes wrong, and for example, this president loses the elections, and the people are going to be not in favor of continuing this Bitcoin experiment, I think we're going to have a bad reputation and this can turn into a second Silk Road moment for Bitcoin, which is going to be regarded as a failure, is going to give all the critics a lot more reasons to criticize it and be like, oh, so this is a currency which could not even serve a small country like El Salvador. You want this to be the future of money? Yeah, I don't know, exactly. maybe I'm pessimistic. That's one, no, that's one of the other interesting points of why this is the, a bad move, right? And the numerous unseen consequences that might arise in the long run here, uh, just because of a hasty adoption by uh, some central manager. And to me, it seems like this was more about virtue sig- signaling than anything. Like, it makes zero sense. If you want to adopt Bitcoin, you can do it just like that. You don't need the government to step in and say, yeah, this is going to be an official currency and everyone must use it. If they wanted to spread adoption in El Salvador and they had the friendship of those in power, they could do it just like that and carry on and empower the people. But I suppose it was never really about empowering the people. It's more about spreading the use cases of a certain wallet and trying to become more popular in a short-term amount of time. Maybe I'm yeah, being too I, I think it's this is just a classical case of a politician thinking that he needs to do something in order for his people, quote-unquote, to excel and thrive. Right? Uh, but as praxeology in Austrian economics tells you, uh, all the moves that you can do are not optimal and they are not the, the, the perfect trade-offs and choices. Uh, by definition, you're completely in the dark and you have no idea what to do. So anything that a politician does you know, is going to be counterintuitive and negative uh, for the economy and for the people within. Uh, so the best move would have been to just do nothing right? and to, at the, at the very least, not prosecute people for using Bitcoin. But also, of course, not forcing people to use Bitcoin. Right? That might actually wreck your economy very much. I agree with you that this is the best way to go about Bitcoin. Just let it blossom, let it be out there in the underground. And if enough people use it and there's a critical mass, you can start moving forward towards adopting it as a currency at an official level. But if you start this from above, during my presentation in Mallorca, and I suppose it's safe to say right now because I'm going to publish this like in a couple of weeks, 
So by then I will have made my presentation, but I'm going to make a case for the revolutions that we have had in our history and explain where it was a revolution from below and where it was a revolution from above and how that turned out to be. Because the French Revolution, for example, was a revolution from below where you had some factions, you had some elite thinkers. For example, you had Robespierre and you also have the Girondins, which were the other faction. But just because they had their clear thinkers and they had their own intellectuals, it doesn't mean that they were coordinated or, or they were the elites. It just means that they had reached a critical mass at that point, which wanted to overthrow the monarchy that they had. And it was a revolution from below because nobody was associated with the government in power at the time. And the same was also kind of the same was with the American Revolution, even though some of the founding fathers were also officials in the Confederation, which is the regime that precedes the Federation of the United States of America. And then you have examples of the Soviet Union, where it was a revolution from above, with somebody coming and establishing something which he claimed to be communism, but was more like state capitalism. And it was a very fragile environment which relied on leaders and needed to have a certain type of obedience and relied on the application of random violence from time to time just to remind people what kind of place they live in and who their boss is. And it was terrible. So as someone who grew up in a country which used to be subordinated to the Soviet Union until 1989, I can tell you from the accounts of my grandparents and parents that it was not ideal and it sucked to be bound to that kind of system. And you're stuck. You just had to do what the state was telling you to do. The state was educating you, giving you a job, giving you a house, deciding when you should retire from work and deciding how much food you could get in a month. In the 80s, they had these cards for food, and you could only have as much, for example, bread and butter and olive oil and gas and sugar as the state decided that you needed. It was not, you know, as the communists say that each according to their needs, it was universal for everyone the exact same. And if you wanted to survive and get more, you needed to start bartering with others. And that's a terrible system. And I've started from the idea of revolutions from above and got to the point where in order to preserve power, they get to all sorts of ridiculous situations and they're willing to do anything to preserve the status quo. And when they try to step back, they destroy the entire system, as it happened with Gorbachev and the USSR when he was trying to decentralize a bit the USSR because it was a huge monolith that was very hard to govern. He ended up dismantling the entire union. And I suppose for our history, that was a happy moment, but that will never erase all the suffering that has happened and all the terrible decisions that led to unfortunate situations. And this only happens with revolutions that come from above and there is no actual will from among the people, maybe just a small minority. And they're going to impose their agenda onto the others and they're not going to be ready for it. And even if it has the best of intentions, the means that it's going to use to get there usually are terrible and make others unhappy. And I think for Bitcoin, we need a lot of education and we need more books, more articles, more podcasts in all the languages, not only English. We need more meetups. We need to help others figure out how this works and why they should be first-class citizens of the network, not people who download a mobile wallet on their phones and get excited for sending and receiving their first transaction. There's a lot to it, and we need to get to work. That's usually my take on it.
Yeah, that's very true. There's a lot of work to be done, uh, and it's not going to get boring in any case. It's never going to get boring. I guess this is why both of us are still around, because it never got boring. No, Sometimes I, I think about the post-hyper-Bitcoinization situation where there is nothing much to be done anymore. We won. That's it. What's next? What's our next rabbit hole? Because I suppose we're so used to being in a minority and being under, what what's the word for it? To be overlooked and underestimated. That's the one that I was looking for. That I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get used to the idea that Bitcoin has won and is the standard. And that's it. It's the end of it. Yeah, that's going to be weird. And kind of nice to be out in the fringes. It's like the wild, wild west. You know, there's there's something exciting when you draw the new boundaries and, and emerge into that chaos of uncertainty in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Uh, it's very enticing for a few, you know, some small minority of people. Most people hate it. That's why nobody uses Bitcoin right now. Um, but the few people who do, well, Bitcoin is made for them right now. What's your plan for the next Bitcoin top? Unless you need the money to purchase something, you probably should not touch infinitely inflationary fiat. Check out Voltoro and figure out to which extent hard money like gold and silver can help you preserve your purchasing power. You will be able to get back into Bitcoin as soon as the price hits a new bottom and you will not be subjected to the arbitrary inflation-driven volatility of fiat or fiat-backed coins. Obviously, this is not financial advice and you should understand that all trading involves risks. Wasabi Wallet connects to your full Bitcoin node and if you're not running one, it downloads block filters anonymously via Tor. In either case, you're getting excellent privacy. Download the software today at wasabiwallet.io. I very much agree. But I suppose even after we had achieved this hyper moment of extreme use and adoption, there are still going to be side chains and all sorts of layers to experiment with. And it's always going to be exciting from this point of view. I don't think you can actually get bored and the options and the applications are only limited by our own imagination. Yeah. And again, right, I mean, I have a list of a thousand and one feature requests that need to be done. So if you're ever bored, hit me up. Uh, I have work to do. <laughs> With Wasabi or with other kinds of applications? Oh no, Wasabi is just one of the many ideas, right? Uh, and in that one idea are a thousand and one small ideas nested. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's it's exponential. I think I should also ask you the questions that you got from listeners and people who follow us. And the first one comes from K Kevin Ravensburg and wants to know how does one escape slash fight a government that enforces mandatory vaccination with experimental content? Yeah, that's a very tough question. Right? And, and ultimately, uh, you will... Well, the best way to get out of a shitty situation like this is to, to leave, right? to vote with your feet and escape the tyranny that is manifesting before your eyes. You know, people did that before Nazi Germany. Countless people fled uh, Germany and and uh, Central Europe in general, and including, by the way, Ludwig von Mises, who was the kind of first to articulate the science of praxeology explicitly by that name. Um, and it's you know getting into a place that is less out of the uh, you know center of craziness is probably a good idea. So being in Europe right now probably a bad move uh, as it was a hundred years ago um, but on the other hand this is a global craziness so every country all over the place is going crazy so where do you escape to well I, i'm guessing in cyberspace right in, in cyberspace you can at least find still a tribe that is um you know 
like-minded and that does not harass you. So prefer to hang out with these people instead with the psychopaths. Uh, but of course, the psychopaths force you to hang out with you. Um, and that that sucks. Uh, so how do you get around that? Um, you know, as much as possible, hack the system. Uh, find ways around uh, the tyranny and find ways to not comply uh, with immoral and abhorrent uh, rules and you know actions. Um, you're responsible for everything you do. Uh, and that includes the responsibility for being part, even being a silent bystander uh, when tyranny like this unfolds. Um, it's only going to get worse. And even though you might not be the one that is being victimized right now, uh, in the future, it might very well be. Right? Uh, many Jews thought at the beginning of the Nazi empire that it's all right because they will not be affected right? because they are the wealthy people or whatnot. Right? But at the end of the Nazi empire, well, they were killing pretty much everyone. It didn't matter, really. Uh, so the same is happening here, right? Even if you're in favor of getting a vaccine now, um, if we start forcing people to get this certain type of vaccine, what will you know hinder the politicians in the future to use that power again and, and to force you to take a vaccine that you in the future don't like? Right? There, that's just something that, yeah, if, if, if silent bystanders will have both uh, ethical and as as well as real consequences for these types of inactions. I mean, I disagree with you in terms of having a terrible situation if you're in Europe. I suppose only in certain European countries it's really bad. Maybe that I'm more fortunate as we justify the fact that vaccination is not mandatory by the fact that we don't really have many cases reported so i suppose we're fine for now but i see it being a lot worse in canada and in the united states and you only find some very small places of sanity maybe in latin america but not in el salvador as they had some of the worst lockdowns and possibly in russia or in Asia. But then again, we don't get much news about that, about those places. So the fact that we don't know doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. It only means that we have a low amount of information about what's going on in these places. I would not want to be in China right now. I would not want to be in any country which has authoritarian tendencies because it's only going to get worse. I don't think it's in any dictator's interest right now to make the people more free. And if even the places that were known for freedom are getting worse, I think the rest of the world is getting just terrible. So I, I feel happy about the place where I am right now. I don't feel happy about traveling. And when I do have to travel, it's nightmare to take tests and pray that you're gonna turn out to be negative because you can also have false positives and if you turn out to be positive you have to stay in quarantine for two weeks in a place that you don't know so it's always like oh, it's this all right the, the hospitality at the gulags is usually quite forthcoming so you'll enjoy it yeah i'll try not to go to the showers <laughs> That, that's a terrible joke, but that's what they were telling the Jewish people in concentration camps before taking them to the gas chambers. <sighs> okay, let's take another question, which is not as grim. Not, not as grim, not, not as grim. So this one is from Ben, and he wants to know, in a world where we know that opinions and ideas can be influenced whether via something as simple as advertising or more deeply insidiously how can we consider an individual's choices to be truly free and what does this mean with regards to liberty that's a good question and one thing to consider is that the aspect that a human can mimic another human right and you can play as if you were the other person that is a characteristic trait that makes us human right and the fundamental differentiation to being for example monkeys right monkeys cannot imitate other monkeys 
Uh, they just don't do that, right? Well, well, humans do. So that's what makes us, in part, a fundamentally social creatures, right? And why we do interact and cooperate so much, because we can imitate each other. Right? That's one of the causes of speech. So it's, you know, that's nothing new. It's not that this is a new concept of the 21st century now because of the internet, right? People are fundamentally influenceable. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's, you know, an advertisement per se. If you just offer, like, tell people that there is something available that they might like, and that's fundamentally nothing bad. And even if you use sly tactics to do a good job at finding out which of the people uh, actually like the stuff that you have to offer, right? So these targeted advertisements are per se not a bad thing. And right? if, if, if a marketing person can find more precisely his targeted audience um, of people who might potentially be interested, he will have a higher success rate. He will deploy less capital in satisfying the needs of a larger number of customers. Uh, that's great. Right? That's ultimately nothing, nothing bad. Right? Where, because even though you have a good advertised, it is still possible to freely choose that good. And right? you, you see some advertisement on YouTube, but you, it doesn't mean that you're a mindless droid that will just go out and buy it instantly. Right? There's a much higher chance that you're just pissed off at the ad because it's annoying in between a video that you want to watch. And so you hate the company who put it there and you will never buy anything of that. Right? Just that this is possible shows you that free will uh, is still in the picture. And uh, but one thing, though, that we are, again, you have to differentiate is that you have the freedom to choose out of multiple potential solutions to a problem. Right? You're hungry, so you might eat a steak or a banana or some potatoes, right? And you can rank order all of these individual options based on which ones you prefer, right? Which you think that will solve your issue in the most sufficient and superior way, right? But uh, ultimately, that this will happen is, is speculation, right? Uh, and just because you eat the steak doesn't mean that in hindsight you think that oh, maybe the potato would have been better. Right? But in any case, just because you are actively doing this process uh, means that you are showing that it is to your own benefit. But it does not mean that the future consequences are inescapable right just because you have a freedom to choose does not mean that you're free to have no responsibilities right each of your actions has causal consequences uh, that you are you know that are unavoidable to you and right? so this has to be considered as well free will comes together with the consequences of action yeah makes a lot of sense and I like that you did not demonize the idea that we get influenced by advertisements or by propaganda or something. There's still free will, even when you look at something. And maybe that it instills ideas in your mind that you would not have had otherwise. But it still doesn't mean that you're going to do as the advertisement sign says. It only means that you're going to think about it. And after you think about it, you're going to come up with your own conclusions or your own reactions to it. So I suppose to some extent, it would be foolish to assume that all of this advertisement shapes behavior. But at the same time, we have all of these influencers who do shape behavior because they try to present their actions as the normal or the norm to which everyone else must live up. And if you look on Instagram, for example, you're going to have definitions for what each subculture is all about. So if you look at travel blogs, you're going to see which places are trendy. And if you look at, for example, computer geeks, you're going to see what kind of systems are popular and most in demand. If you look at musicians, you're going to see what kind of instruments are the most popular and what kind of equipment they're using. 
So there is some extent of influencing people. For example, I never wanted, what's it called? The Rode? No, I have the Rode. It's called the Shure SM7B, which is the microphone that Joe Rogan uses. I would have never wanted it if I didn't see it during the Joe Rogan show. But then I saw Peter McCormack using it and I realized that I don't want one. (laughs) I, I don't want to sound like him. So, yeah. You always find these examples and these headlines and these advertisements. But I I don't think that they are as efficient as we think that they are. And coming from somebody who's offering a magazine for free with the promise that people are going to see advertisements in them and it might help promote their products, I think this doesn't sound too good. But just tell the people from Wasabi that they're fine and they should keep on sponsoring me. <laughs> yeah, I for sure have my quarrels with advertisers for sure. Uh, and I think that the extent of advertisement that we see now is just a symptom that we see as a consequence of the fiat regime during the creation of the Internet. And I think that once we have a sound monetary system established within the Internet, that this will clean up fundamentally the production of information in cyberspace and the the payment for that for that production, and so that entrepreneurs have actually a, a sound profit incentive uh, to be part in creating this incredible knowledge archive. This changes everything, right? So that that being considered, uh, even though advertising per se is completely ethical and has only good economic consequences based that it is still within the voluntary principles right? it doesn't mean that the current manifestation of extent of advertisement is not abhorrent and will re- be reduced in the future when was the last time you saw some sort of advertisement and you wanted to get that oh you know i'm i'm so much decked out with ad blockers and free and open source software like new pipe or or like cubes that just don't have, you know, no ads. So, But you go outside, right? You could walk into stores <laughs> and you see an ad for Coca-Cola or something. Yeah, okay, okay. That, that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, I mean, that's near impossible to say because, you know, the, the way advertisement works is like not that you see the thing one time and then magically you end up buying a Coke, right? It's that you see the Coke sign 50 times And then one time you're thirsty and all of a sudden you choose Coke without even cautiously having that sign in front of you right now. But just because it was in your subconsciously seen 50 times before that, it is an option that you consider out of the vast number of possible options. And so when was the last time was influenced? Well, that's really tough to say. Again, that's deeply in the realm of psychology and not so much in the realm of praxeology. Yeah, I think I saw some ASIC that's made in the United States and is designed for home use. So it's low powered, low noise. I think it's about seven times weaker than the S9, but it's designed to be left to run in your living room. And it's also kind of on the affordable side. It's about $600. So I really wanted one the moment when I saw it, but not because there was a lot of advertisement for it, but because it's something for which I had been looking for a long time, something that you can use for mining at home. And I think that if we truly want this network to be decentralized, we need to take a lot more action and take more of the matters into our own hands as opposed to waiting to see what others are going to do. And not only that, but they cannot possibly ban mining if it's being used by a large amount of people, just because it's hard and the bans will not scale. It's the same with nodes, I think. They cannot ban private wallets, that's what they call them, just because some bureaucrats think it's a good idea. As there are so many who are running their own full nodes, that it's going to be very hard to enforce and it's going to turn into a very unpopular issue which is going to cost them the elections if they go forward with it. So I I think we should go forward with personal mining and 
this was my example of something for which I saw just one advertisement. And I was like, I really want this. And I was kind of the same with the coin mine. I think that's what you call it, coin mine. The one that was presented by Pomp. But then I found out that it's based on an Intel Celeron processor with an RX 580 video card. So it's mining shit coins and giving you the rewards in Bitcoin. So if you're using that one, not only that you're paying, you're overpaying for a machine which you can build for about half the price, but also you are not really helping the Bitcoin network with your hash rate. You're mining shit coins. So you're actually legitimizing shit coins and some people might buy it and not be aware of it of what they're doing in the background. So yeah, I think we need more ASICs and not necessarily designed for industrial large-scale use in farms. That's true. But you know, when you're an unprofitable miner, then you arguably don't provide any additional security to the network. Uh, So it's, you know, in many cases, especially, you know, somewhere in Europe where you have massive high costs for consumer grade energy in households. Uh, it's probably just more of a waste of your time and your sats rather than a benefit to the network. Yeah, but I think that decentralization isn't all about elim- eliminating a single point of failure, but also individual action and contribution. And we should also keep the network permissionless as Unless we contribute in a permissionless nature, we're going to see regulators step in and decide who gets to participate and who doesn't. And from that point on, if it becomes illegal, it doesn't mean that we cannot still mine on Tor or something, but it just becomes a lot harder to do and the average person is not going to have the incentive to break the law just to secure the Bitcoin network by themselves. Yeah, that I agree with. So I think that while the network is still young and they haven't figured out everything, we need to take more actions for the network. But I I also think that I got a bit sidetracked from the initial point of the question. So you want to take another one? Sure. So Jimbo, the consensualist, wants to know operating system recommendations for running a full node. And he tagged the fuck is a Lamy <laughs> who wants to know about this. And I know that you replied on Twitter, but I think it's useful to also record this. Yeah, sure. So personally, I just am a free software enthusiast. So any distro recommendation is going to be free software, naturally. Um, and for... Uh, a laptop operating system, I can very much recommend Cubes. Uh, it's it's awesome. It basically allows your one physical hardware to host near unlimited numbers of virtual computers. And you can use a new virtual computer for each uh, like program that you're using. And that's really, really cool. Especially to have, for example, a separate virtual machine to take care of your private keys. Right? And a different virtual machine for... Twitter, for example, right, or some somewhat insecure public messaging thing. And this way, your precious sets uh, stay uh, secure. Right? One of the major downsides of cubes is uh, absolutely the, the power consumption and the computational load. It's much more heavy than other operating system just because, because it runs many, many more computers. And so this might not be a reasonable choice for everyone. And then the alternative, especially when we're considering running a full node, I would argue is just a pure Debian server. Uh, Debian is a fundamental uh, operating system in the Linux space, and it is what powers most server infrastructures. And ultimately, your full node is a server, right? So using an operating system that is um, optimized for that uh, is a great idea. And I bring this up specifically because of the Crypto Anarchy Debian repository, which is a easy way to install Bitcoin applications on the Debian operating system. And, and that's uh, uh, it's, it's one that I use personally and that I 
can recommend because it is extremely easy uh, to use that. Uh, right now, only with a command line interface, but it's basically something like sudo apt install btc pay server. And then this repository figures automatically out that you need, for example, you know, a Bitcoin Core and Tor and Nginx, you know, and BTC Pay Server. And all of these pieces of software need to be installed. Um, and then you need to uh, configure them and, you know, make sure that everything runs secure behind Tor and that all of the access credentials are securely done. But the cool thing is that this all happens in this Debian repository. Uh, so everything is nicely configured and it just runs out of the box magically uh, in a rather secure setup, uh, which I like. I guess the other alternative that is even more security focused would be uh, Nix Bitcoin. Uh, but Nix is um, much more. That's N-I-X, right? NIX, yes, that's a much more of like fundamentally different approach of how to do an operating system. So it's for sure going to be much more tricky for other people to use it. But let's hope it, uh, it give it a shot as well. It's nice for sure, at least to try it out. I know at least a couple of people who work on that. There is Stick from Trezor. And I think there was also Daniela Brozani at some point, but they were working on Nix OS, not yes, Nix Bitcoin, or Nix maybe Bitcoin. that also Nix Bitcoin. Nix Bitcoin is a kind of uh, like a, something on top of Nix OS. So Nix Bitcoin uses Nix OS in order to run servers that you that speak Bitcoin software. And then, for example, Jonas Nick uh, is an influential contributor to this. Uh, or some anonymous accounts as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are lots of people from the space work on that one. And you also have one last question from Ben Ark, but you told me that when you guys get to talk, it lasts for four to five hours. And I'm going to ask you to do it just as concisely as you can, because we don't have Ben Ark right here to respond. So it's not going to be a real debate, but he says by praxeology, ignoring reflexive behavior, empirical evidence and scientific method, is it not just rhetoric detached from the realities of our sneezing, farting human material, ah, material reality? I can't say material. So to summarize, he's saying that if you ignore reflexive behavior, and empirical evidence and scientific method, then praxeology is just rhetoric, which is detached from the realities of our human material reality. Yes, what, what he brings up is a, a point of view that was laid out uh, by a behavioralism tradition in economic analysis, right? basically stating that the point of focus also needs to include reflective actions right so like things like breathing right or um you know uh, like leisure walking or farting or all the things that he brings up right that these need to be considered in the economic analysis and this is where mises had a fundamental disagreement and even you know his masters before eugen von birnberg and even before that karl menger um, these guys had a fundamental disagreement with that, that in order to have a useful and reasonable level of analysis, we should focus not on the reflexes. Reflexes are some like are in the realm of psychology again, basically. But instead, we should focus on the conscious human action. And that human action that has the structure of First, living in a state of uneasiness and to basically have a problem, um, and then to have the genius entrepreneurial spark, so to say, to find, to think of a future where this problem is solved, right? And to find a way to get from A to B, right? This, this is basically what the action that we, anal that we analyze. And it's not just... Uh, something like farting it's more like something like building a cathedral right or or building a large um you know boat or other deliberate and conscious actions right? and if we want to 
discuss meaningful impact of economics, reflexive behavior is not the right level of analysis. I'm convinced of that. Um, but rather it is individual analysis uh, or the analysis of individual human action that is in a conscious manner done to solve specific problems. And, and because when we reduce our level of analysis to this realm and when we exclude things like psychology, right, then all of a sudden the results of our reasoning become more useful and more, um, yeah, more concrete, more concise um, and more precise. Like it's more accurate to think about it that way. Yeah, I understand your point of view. I'm not sure if Ben would agree if he was here, but it's still useful to understand that there are different schools of thought and you choose not to focus on the behavior he chooses to do it specifically. And, you know, at least this is a productive debate as opposed to something which can have no conclusion or does not educate either party into understanding some different points of view. Exactly. And, you know, this is such an age old uh, debate. Um, and, you know, there, many great men had massive disagreements on these questions. And it's quite unlikely that we will even articulate the problem on the same level of magnitude that the, as these guys have. And even less likely that we will come to any meaningful con consensus and conclusion on the question. Right. But uh, just for, for you guys as further reference, two books here that are very valuable is a book by Ludwig von Mises called Theory and History. It's a treatise on the method methodological approach that is useful for economic analysis. It's basically the book where he lays out praxeology as the methodological approach in thinking about economics. And I think in this book, he answers you the question of why behavioralism is not useful and why instead we ought to focus on conscious actions rather than reflexive behavior. Um, and the second book that is written much later, I think theory and history was something like 1920 or something. Um, well, uh, the next book was written in 2008, I believe, called The Last Night of Liberalism. Uh, written by Jörg Guido Hilsmann, uh, who wrote this as a biography of the great Ludwig von Mises. Uh, but he also goes here even in the beginning of the book into the pre-Misesian times uh, of specifically um, Karl uh, Mengel, Eugen van Bömberberg, Christian Schumpeter, and other people who are studying in Vienna uh, precisely with the struggle of finding out which methodology to use uh, to analyze human behavior. Right? And this is a very, very deep methodenstreit, uh, famous in, in philosophy, so to say, um, where, for example, also uh, psychologists like Jung and Freud were quite influential. And here again, Mises is very much in a core with Jung and Freud from a methodological approach. Both parties here, both sides, use individualistic reasoning you know, as their guiding principle for how to look at their unique science. And they just clearly differentiate that one is psychology and the other is economics. Right? But the basic way of looking at the problem is the same. Well, contradictory to that, right? we have group psychology or collective um, uh, uh, well, racism, of course, and Keynesianist economics. economics this, these are all collectivist ways of looking at the world, fundamentally different to the methodological individualism uh, of psychology and um, economics. Right. So something which I want to add at this point, because you mentioned Schumpeter, I've actually studied him in university. And he was from Vienna. And there's a funny story about him because at some point in his later life, he said that he had three major goals in life. To be the greatest horseman as a rider of horses in all of Vienna. To be the great, greatest lover in all of Vienna and have the most beautiful women around. And to be the greatest economist in the world. And he confessed 
like when he was 70 or something that in his life he was only able to accomplish two of these but he's not gonna mention which <laughs> you know actually uh, in in the great book of the last night of liberalism uh this highlights that schumpeter was very much in line originally with the individualist methodological approach uh but then later in life actually he stra he strayed away from that way of thinking and uh ca capitulated to a more collectivist level of analysis so i actually agree that later in life he f he failed to be as consistent as a hero like ludwig von mises was uh and the two were great studying companions in early days and i think had a lot of things in common in their way of looking at the world but ultimately mises turned out to be more consistent and a student of mises murray rothbard even more consistent that his, than his master yeah i guess we can think of schumpeter just like our contemporary nasim taleb both of them capitulated and yeah, exactly. gave in to the more popular opinions of their times. Yep, they were onto something, but then capitulated. But we should not, you know, throw away what they have given us up to a certain point. Just because they ended up resenting what they created doesn't mean that what they created was useless or valueless. Exactly, absolutely. Uh, it makes sense to continue to take the good ideas of people while discard the bad ideas of them. You know, that's why critical thinking is useful. Yeah, and that's why I also regard Bitcoiners who capitulated at some point and went into forks or went into shitcoins. I think they're going to be back and I'm not going to be too hard on them when they do. There are already lots of Puritans who are going to be like, oh, no, you're a shitcoiner. You can never become one of us, Roger Veer. <laughs> but if Roger ever comes back, I'm going to be like, yeah, it was inevitable. It It's part of it. He was wrong. He was stubborn, just like many of us get. I think in the future, in the next five to ten years, we're going to see Zuko and Roger Ver and who else? Lots of people who got into shitcoins are going to be back to Bitcoin because... I don't see maybe that they're milking their last US dollars from the marketing, but I don't see these projects having a sustainable future. They're just there as what they claim to be alts. And I've always been puzzled by this terminology to call them altcoins because it means that they're alternatives to Bitcoin. So the fact that we have altcoins, just the fact that they get defined as altcoins means that they are inferior by design and they only come up with one or two different ideas and they're gonna fail and i think that if anything when we never really had an altcoin and this is my maximalist altcoin perspective we never really had the altcoin because all of them are basically terrible copies which change a few parameters and try to identify a different use case but we never had something truly revolutionary which did not use a blockchain, did not use something from the Nakamoto consensus. And I don't know, maybe that we're going to be seeing something radically different out there. And to me, that's going to be the real true alternative to Bitcoin, something which is massively different from this design and not, not proof of stake. Yeah, let's see what we come up with in the future. But yeah, I agree that so far, Bitcoin is by far the best alternative. Yeah, we never had a real alternative. Like we had something like Bitcoin, but with different features. Different trade-offs, I guess, in the end. And maybe I can understand some libertarians who don't, care much about maximalism and they say that they only care about maximizing their freedom and they're gonna use whichever network allows them to transact without getting tracked or without using features of the us dollar system but it's all gonna come into side chains and it's really promising like when you discover what's actually going on and why they're not really promoting it because it's not possibly ready for mass adoption, but it's still very promising. When you look into RSK, 
and you see what they're doing with drive chains, even if you disagree and you think that drive chains are a terrible attack on the network, it's still exciting to know that you can do all of these features with side chains. By the way, what's your take on BIP 300 with drive chains? Uh, you know, anarchy and money, this is free software. If people want to run it, sure. Um, but uh, side chains are very interesting technology in general, uh, as they, you know, can function as verifiable money warehouses, which are very interesting second layer technologies that kind of I see as an upgrade to custodial versions and uh, something like, you know, a, a federated two way pack like Blockstream's Liquid is basically a federated custodian ship. And so you trust the federation of pro mostly exchanges uh, with a shared key set. You know, and these people watch over your Bitcoin and in exchange you have a, a certificate that allows you to redeem. Uh, your That certificate allows you to redeem Bitcoin from that large multi-signature. It's, it's all right. It's great. It's a beautiful achievement in, in monetary and banking technology. Um, drive chain makes a bit of a different assumptions or trade-offs where there is not a single federation, so to say, that has a multi-signature scheme and that custodies your Bitcoin, but rather that as long as a majority of miners are honest um, to the uh, uh, sidechain consensus, uh, that then it becomes impossible for other people to steal. Right? But if a majority of miners are malicious, then they can actually run away with your money. So in a, in a sense, even though it's very different in the nuances, but roughly speaking, instead of trusting a federation of, of professionals, you trust uh, miners uh, to not run away with your money. And now who are you going to trust? Right? And it very much depends on the implementation and how well you know the federation members and stuff. But in general, I would tend to favor the federated model to the drive chain model. Um, but both are very interesting and different tools used for different uh, problems. I'm not sure if I agree. Like, I don't think that the federation is ideal. There's a lot of trust involved. but we shall see, you know, this is the beauty of the system. You never know what's going to happen. And there's so much happening at the same time. And there's so much competition that usually it's the best solution that wins. It was the same with the Lightning Network. You had Peter Todd and others trying to design something. And then it was this guy, Joseph Poon, who came up with the better idea. And everyone agreed that it was the best one to implement, even if the creator turned out to be a shitcoiner in the end and did not care much for his own invention. We went with it because it was better design. It's actually going to be very interesting to see how the layers are going to look like because what we have right now is still very rudimentary and very basic. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and it will be interesting uh, to see how it will play out. Vlad, it was a pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed uh, our time here in that conversation. Likewise, and I could sense that you got tired as we were talking. So it was only natural for this to come to an end. And it's kind of sad. I've had you on one episode for, I guess, three seasons in a row. So this is remarkable. And it's always a pleasure. And it's always fascinating to see that we don't talk the same stuff I don't feel like we repeated ourselves this time. No, no. And that's the nice thing. The rabbit hole is so, so deep uh, that there's always something new to talk about. Okay, Max. So I'm going to keep on listening to join the Wasabi Cause every week and also feature the latest episode on the Bitcoin Takeover Radio. And you should also listen to it because he has guests that make me feel jealous because I can't get them. So <laughs> Max is great. Well, thank you very much. And also thanks a lot for, for putting us into the uh, um, takeover radio stream. That's uh, awesome. I love these types of collaborations and shared exposure. Uh, that's that's cool. And the more we can shill Bitcoin, uh, the better. Yeah. And also let me know how I can send you a magazine because that's my latest venture right now. Giving people free magazines with help from sponsors. 
Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Great that you're doing that too. Yeah, I try. So thank you, Max. I know you have to go and I'll talk to you later. Yes, thank you very much and see you on the next one. Bye bye. Bye. Golden Bitcoin, 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 golden Bitcoin. Voltora. Wasabi Wallet's innovative coin joints will make your bitcoins more fungible. So if you accumulate more than 0.1 BTC, you can mix it with other users to remove all traces about their whereabouts. So it's like putting multiple fingerprints on your dollar bills and it becomes impossible to determine the last few owners of the money. Download Wasabi Wallet today and start coin joining.